So today we are hearing from Margaret Smigo with a talk entitled Public Health and Harmful Algae Blooms. Margaret has served as the Waterborne Hazards Program Coordinator at Virginia Department of Health for six years, overseeing the Coastal Beach Monitoring Program, Virginia Harmful Algae Bloom Task Force, and supporting outreach and education for waterborne recreational water illness prevention. Prior work experience includes total maximum daily load coordinator for the Department of Environmental Quality, adjunct biology teacher at Virginia Commonwealth University or VCU and health inspector for BDH. Academic and leadership accomplishments include a fellowship with the Virginia National Natural Resources Leadership Institute via the Institute of Engagement and Negotiation at the University of Virginia, in addition to a master's of science degree in environmental studies and a BS in biology from VCU. Thank you all for attending and let's get into it. Um, one note is if you have any questions throughout the lecture, please send them directly to Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River in the chat. And I will ask them uh, to Margaret at the end of the presentation. And thanks so much for being here today, Margaret. Absolutely, thanks for having me. All right, so let's get started folks. Hi everyone. Oh, we're going to talk about a super fun event that happened this past summer on the North Fork Shenandoah River. Uh, for those of you that weren't aware, we had our first benthic cyanobacteria bloom on the North Fork, somewhat unexpected. Um, and um, this is a picture of one of the sites where we had uh, quite a bit of cyanobacteria growing along the bottom of the river. Um, you can almost kind of see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but almost looks kind of floaty and lettucey here. And it's a very deep green. Uh, those of you that uh, recreate on the river, you've probably seen uh, your fair share of filamentous algae, which is a green non-toxin former. This stuff we're talking about today produces toxins um, and it has the potential to not only cause health effects in people, uh, but also to uh, pets and if we have very high levels of toxins being produced. We can also impact our drinking water uh, intakes. So let's get started. Just a little bit of a background on our um, HAB program at the Virginia Department of Health. And historically, we have done a lot of work in marine waters. And that is due to the aquaculture that we have off of the, the coast of Virginia. And so, 20 years, we've done quite a bit of monitoring um, and haven't had too many issues recently. Um, however, in the 2010s, we started to pay attention nationally. There were a lot of freshwater blooms that were occurring in reservoirs and in lakes, smaller ponds that were shallower. Um, and so we started to look into that same, those same water um, bodies in Virginia, and we were finding plenty of toxin, potential toxin producers, um, and a few blooms. And over time, that program has grown and grown. We've had several larger water bodies, like Anna, for instance, uh, that has been blooming each year with advisories um, since 2017, 2018. And so that program has grown, though our funding sadly has not. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we, we are very concerned as well with our partners in the Office of Drinking Water here at VDH about the potential impacts for drinking water and the safety of our drinking water um, sources. So some of the services that we provide on the VDH side, um, we have a web page where all of our resources, including the online HAB report form, can be found. So if you're just out having a good time and you see something that looks a little scummy and you think you might be looking at an algae bloom, um, or maybe you saw some green lettucey floaty stuff uh, on the bottom of the, uh, the river while you were out kayaking, um, you can just pull out your smartphone and snap a picture and submit that to us and we can investigate it. Um, we, when we do an investigation for a suspected harmful algae bloom, um, we will put the results on our HAB map um, we have a virtual HAB toolkit with lots of information. We have tons of signage and all of our ancillary documents. And just this past year, we updated our advisory guidance, um, which was very exciting for us. So new materials to work with. 
And so just to kind of give you a little bit of insight why this bloom on the North Fork was such a big deal, um, especially for us, not just the state, but most of our blooms that we have experience responding to and analyzing, they're occurring in bowl type systems where you have very slow moving water and they're planktonic or pelagic. They're sort of homogeneous throughout the water. Um, and so if you sample, um, let's say here off the shore, you walk 20 feet along the shoreline, you would expect to have a reasonably similar representative sample. Um, you can uh, get more concentrated along the shoreline where it's shallower. Um, you can get some scum formation. I think I have a little animation here that shows, here's a picture of some scum. You can see some rivulets here along the shoreline um, where scum is, um, that's just dead cell particles. They float up really dense bloom events cells are constantly dividing and creating new cells and they're dying off and that um, the waste, including all those um, photosynthetic uh, chloroplasts are also floating up to the surface. And that's why you tend to see blue green, also we call them blue green algae blooms as well. That stuff is also more likely to contain toxins during cyanobacteria bloom events. So cyanos are the ones that can produce toxins. Not all of them can produce toxins, and even if they can produce them, they won't always produce them. It's very hard for us to know without a sample. Um, so some of the ways that we worry about public exposure during uh, toxic bloom events, um, accidental ingestion. So if you're swimming, you're more likely to put your head underwater, accidental uh, ingestion. And those toxins uh, can affect the gastrointestinal systems, the liver, the kidneys, and those are the ones that are most at risk if you um, accidentally swallow the water. Obviously, if you have a drinking water reservoir and the treatment system is not able to remove the toxins, you could affect the water supply. Our younger populations are going to be most at risk because of their lower body weight. You can also, just by skin contact, there are some irritative compounds, um, not necessarily toxins, but rashes are really common. Um, and you can also breathe in aerosolized toxins if you have a super intense bloom or if you have a little wave action or riffling. And usually when we're sampling in this kind of a bowl system, we're collecting water column samples. And we're usually gonna, if we have this scum like you see here in this picture, we're gonna try to get that top layer of water to get the scum. That's where toxins are most likely gonna be concentrated. And then we're also gonna try to get um, about elbow deep um, sa a water sample there as well. So we will get two samples of the scum was present. And then we would analyze it and our new guidance contains um, advisory thresholds for four cyanotoxins listed here in these concentrations, um, like gram per liter or parts per billion. And we have a hybrid approach where we're looking um, not just at toxin production, we're also looking at cell concentration. Um, the WHO says that any bloom that's over 100,000 cells per milliliter is much more likely to produce toxins if you have potential uh, toxin formers present. So that's our typical scenario uh, that we see with bloom events in Virginia. Um, and the less typical scenario um, is our benthic blooms. And this is nationwide as well, but they are becoming more, more common. And benthic blooms are not gonna occur usually in a slow moving system. They're gonna be in a fast moving system something that has constant flow like a river system. It's also probably gonna occur in something that has a shallow, shallow uh, depth where you have light penetrating to the bottom substrates. Um, this stuff, uh, the, the benthic mats are very fibrous interlocking cells, kind of like a, a tangled matty weave. And it will grow from the bottom substrates, taking up nutrients from the sediments along the bottom. And as it grows, it starts to kind of detach kind of like that let lettucey picture we saw. It'll detach, float up to the surface, and then it will float its merry way downstream and collect along the, the sinuous areas of the river and where it can be potentially eaten by your favorite pet who likes stinky, smelly things that are decomposing. Um, and so we do get mats as opposed to scums associated with these blooms. And unlike the toxins, the toxins in a bowl system are going to be in the scum top layer. The toxins are going to pretty much stay in the matte material in benthic blooms. Um, unless you have such a concentrated matte with so much toxin being produced, 
you can start to detect it in the water column. And so that's sort of the difference here with a benthic bloom, you really do need to get that matte material analyzed if you wanna know the sort of the, the toxin concentration. Because if you're only able to collect water samples, kind of hit or miss. Um, you may not, you may miss the toxins entirely. It may not be leaving or leaving those cell walls and getting into the water matrix. Um, but typically what we do is we, want to collect a mat sample as well as a nearby water sample. So you have both areas in the water represented. The other difference is that with benthic blooms, you don't have a homogeneous expectation because you can sample here or just kind of look and see where the mats are forming. But down here, there may be no mats. So very hit or miss in these areas. And you really can't expect representation from spot to spot to spot. It's, it, they're not representative of each other necessarily. Um, exposures are fairly, fairly similar, except usually there has to be some kind of consumption of the matte product itself for an intoxication. Um, and this is gonna occur usually with pets because humans aren't usually gonna eat this unless you have a child that doesn't know better. So livestock and pets are the most at risk. Um, and we can have some uh, skin there is one kind of benthic former that produces a, a skin irritant toxin, but most risk is uh, through consumption or if you have a benthic bloom occurring around the drinking water intake um, and the toxins are getting released and into the water column and making it their way into the drinking water column. So that's kind of a little bit of a background there on the difference between the two and why benthic blooms are so different. We had never had, prior to this advisory issued this past summer, we hadn't had to issue an advisory prior to that. And it was also our first year where we had a method for not only sample collection of benthic mats, but toxin analysis and um, cell identification and enumeration. So first year doing it, we had to have some advisories, of course. So. Let's move on. Um, these are just some photos of the different um, ways that benthic blooms can present, sort of like a garden on the bottom. And then it can also sort of be paraphytic on substrate. So like this is a stick and it's just kind of growing on and around anything that's there. Again, we are going to want to get a water cone sample just to see what we have leaving the, the mats and in, in get, getting into the water column as well. If you're interested in taking a look at our guidance document, again, that was updated this past year. Um, you can take a look at it on our website. We did include some very flexible language about how we were gonna manage blooms. Um, you know, nationally, there really aren't any advisory thresholds in the US. There are states that have had many benthic blooms that they've had to manage. And so they have developed their own sort of protocol for managing them. Um, but benthic blooms have to be handled very differently from planktonic blooms um, because the, the units aren't exactly the same. You can't necessarily compare apples to apples, uh, planktonic bloom threshold with a uh, benthic result. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and so moving forward, it's sort of like if you have, if you identify you have some matte bloom going on, um, you're gonna wanna just try to say, all right, well, do we have potential toxin formers? And if we do, we're probably gonna issue an advisory whether whether or not we're picking up toxins in the water, the mat, what have you. Um, if you have a toxin former present, um, it, it, you probably could assume that toxins could be produced. And that's the conservative public health approach we tend to take. Um, so uh, there are a few uh, niche um, countries that have developed their own protocols because they've had so many of these benthic events, um, New Zealand and Cuba. Um, and in the U.S., we have not only had, you know, several states that have struggled with this, California has hundreds of miles of benthic uh, advisories issued every year, but also numerous pet intoxications and livestock deaths. So it's happening. Um, it's just a lot of people aren't yet sampling for it. And until we were able to analyze for it, we had a method. Um, we didn't have any advisories. First year, we had an advisory. And we were prepared in 2021 because of an uh, investigation that occurred in 2020 in uh, Lake Gaston. Lake Gaston for years, and we, we hadn't, it hadn't been risen to our attention until we got a, a couple of complaints 
about these mats, these floating mats in Lake Gaston and the coves along the Virginia uh, North Carolina border. Um, and for years, they've been there's been a concerted effort to physically remove these mats uh, from the coves that are kind of a nuisance and they can get stuck in boat propellers. Um, again, a very thick, matty weave that can form from these filaments. We, knowing that they link the species that were pro prevalent there could produce toxins, it uh, inspired us to start developing our method for analyzing it. And we had full expectations that we would be going back down to Lake Gaston over the summer. Um, didn't realize we would be heading north instead. So um, we did have a, a method ready for that. If you're interested, we, we did produce a public health, um, sort of a, a brochure for folks who were concerned about the potential um, health effects of Lingvia and Lake Gaston that is available on our website. And so prior to 2021, we had our fair share of um, harmful algal bloom complaints that tended to be co-located with nuisance complaints that went to our um, sister agency, Department of Environmental Quality, who investigates those. Um, what you see pictured is um, a green, non-toxic forming um, algae, filamentous algae. Um, it coats um, rocks and can be quite slippery and uh, can impede our enjoyment, our recreational enjoyment of the river. In uh, 2018 to 2020, about 20% 20 of all of our complaints were in that section of the river co-located with those nuisance algal complaints. Of course, we investigated them, didn't find any um, presence of cyanobacteria species. Uh, of course, we didn't have a method for analyzing uh, toxins in the map until this past year. And so we went into the season with a plan for how we were gonna collect mats if we saw mats that we wanted to analyze um, and knew that we could um, analyze the mat material as well as the water column for all four of our cyanotoxins. Just grab a quick sip of water. Get us through these next two super intense slides. We have our timeline highlights of recreational water response. So getting into the sampling and response and advisory that went into what ended up being a 52 mile length advisory for the North Friction Doe River. And it started off in the early, uh, right after the holiday in July, um, where we had a co-located complaint for nuisance algae at Seven Bends with a, a HAB complaint online. So DEQ investigated and why they happened to be out investigating for that complaint. They ended up up in the Bethel Road area where they saw this beautiful um, lettuce grove of <laughs> cyanobacteria, uh, benthic bloom uh, ongoing that covered a, a pretty dense area, 10 to 20% coverage of that the bottom of that area. And so their water samples um, were pretty good for that site. The mat samples, we did see what we call potentially toxic cyanobacteria. I'm gonna call that PTOX for short. Um, we could not analyze the toxins for that sample because of the method in which it, the sample was collected. And that's pretty standard. You're gonna run into that when you have a new method with folks using it for the first time. Um, and so we had a, a little bit of you know, growing pains with that. Um, 714, um, we had some additional reports up in the Strasbourg area, which raised some red flags because we do have a drinking water intake for the town there along the river. And then right ahead of the weekend, our, we had informed our local health director of our investigation and that we were waiting for sample results. Um, to kind of get ahead of that and to let folks know about that investigation, the potential that there may be a bloom ongoing. There was a social media release that you see here on the far right, issued by Lord Fairfax, um, for that area around Bethel Road. Um, and so 719 DEQ, the next week, they went out and they were responding to the Strasbourg um, complaints. They, they had very minimal uh, PTOX represented in the water samples, no concerns about toxins, but we, in our mat sample, we were able to detect uh, anatoxin A and microsystem. And so that was very concerning again, because that's up near the drinking water intakes. And so in response to those findings, we felt it necessary along with the, the health director 
who has the ultimate authority in terms of whether we issue advisories or not. We, we decided to sort of bookend that area, five mile stretch um, along Bethel Road um, for an advisory, a recreational advisory. And so as we went through the weeks of July, we continued getting more and more reports, which is very much expected. If you issue an advisory, there's heightened, um, you know, the, the interest is heightened and people are paying attention and they're looking for this stuff or maybe they didn't pay attention before. And so we had additional um, reports and additional samples. You know, we're, we're starting to get to the point where we're getting more and more reports. In total, we had 16 reports just for the North Fork alone in the month of July. Um, when we were able to get our results for some um, samples for the Lower River Road site, um, we again, we did a resample as well on Bethel Road and Strasburg, where we found not only uh, microcystin, but also anatoxinate and saxitoxin. Saxitoxin is interesting. You don't see it as often with benthic. We tend to see more anatoxin A, but saxitoxin is only second in toxicity to ricin. And most of us know that uh, from a few uh, Hollywood movies, which is a pretty scary toxin. So anyways, moving on, uh, we were finding it and we, uh, in response to those three sites, we issued an extension of that original um, advisory that was five mile, extended it to eight miles to capture that lower river road site. And the next week, unfortunately, we, we heard from our lab, Old Dominion uh, University Phytoplankton Analysis Lab, informed us that in processing the samples, they started to have symptoms. Three of their staff started to have some symptoms. And for the most part, once they left, the site where the mat material was contained within about 15 minutes, all symptoms would dissipate. And so because they, they felt they didn't have the right equipment to remove um, aerosolized particles that were off-gassing from the material, they made the, the very smart decision to not accept any more mat material for analysis. They would continue to accept water column samples. Um, a few days later, um, we were also sort of expecting, you know, everybody's been really busy and responding and uh, trying to get these investigations done at all these new sites, but the DEQ resources started to get a little overwhelmed. They still have to get out every week and do their observations for the filamentous program. They're also trying to get out and get all these other sites sampled for have reports. They decided to make the executive decision for conserving their resources. We're going to back off we're not gonna do any more resamples, but we will investigate all new complaints, which put us in a little tricky situation because we have an advisory in place. We can't lift an advisory unless we have additional samples. So that sort of meant, well, we're, we're gonna have an advisory in place for a little while, I guess. Um, and resources were tight. We did not have an alternative lab either to send any map material to. Um, so we were starting to explore other options, reaching out to partners, trying to figure out what to do next. Um, and because of how things were sort of working out, low resources, no lab, we got some results above and below that eight mile segment at two sites we investigated where we were getting additional toxins um, in not just the, uh, in the water column itself, as well as, um, I, some residual results prior to the lab discontinuing their analysis of mats. We had some one, one or two more mat material samples that we were able to get results on. We had identified PTOX in the mats as well. So we ended up making the decision uh, to extend the advisory to be conservative. We'll look at a, a map in a minute to explain why we felt that was necessary. Um, and then fortunately, unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, we had Tropical Storm Ida that came through. And we have the flow uh, graph here on the bottom right of just how big of an event that was for the North Fork Shenandoah. Um, it essentially was a scouring event due to the flow and velocity in the river, which helped to move that mat material off of the bottom, sending it down, down the river, ending up in the Potomac. Um, and in advance of the storm, the ICPRB, the Potomac River Basin Commission, they um, decided to study using their emergency spill model, uh, which lets them see how fast or how slow uh, pollutants that could impact 
the drinking water intakes along the Potomac, how those things are moving downstream and when they could expect impacts to drinking water. So they decided preemptively ahead of the storm, we're gonna take samples to see if we can detect these toxins that might be in map material moving downstream, see if we can see it. Um, and they uh, produced a paper, if you'd like to check it out, it is available online. Um, they did not detect the to any toxins in the flow because it was such a huge flow event. Not surprising. Okay, so call that here. So now we're gonna move into the maps. All right, so this is the 52 mile extent of the advisory that was issued um, early August. And the decision to kind of go from five and eight, which was sort of in the middle of the river or towards the middle of, up in the north part of that stretch in Strasburg, um, we were seeing the toxins initially again in both the water and the benthic mats. Um, and then when we lost our ability to look at benthic mats, we were just looking at water samples only. Um, but the sort of the, the 26th of July and the early August samples um, were above and below those initial advisory areas in Strasburg. Um, and on the northern part near Woodstock, we not only have Seven Men State Park where we had that green dot is that 712 sample DEQ investigated at co-located um, nuisance algae site. We also happen to have a, a health complaint from someone who spent some time in the river there. Um, and we happen to have a drinking water intake there at Woodstock. So we wanted to get above. If we can't sample where we want to sample and get all of the mat samples analyzed that we want, we feel like it would be best to kind of get above Woodstock and find a, an area that would be easy to identify by, the, by the using the river, which was Chapman's Landing. And then um, where we have Cedar Creek here, where we were able to detect um, toxins as well, we decided to go about five miles south to Riverton where we have another, another boat ramp. So that allowed us to kind of bookend. We had some other samples that were collected on either side of these two bookends as well that indicated we didn't, we weren't seeing any uh, benthic mats and we weren't seeing any toxins either. So we felt pretty secure in this being a, a relatively conservative, um, rather large advisory for us. And then, um, so we, in terms of lifting advisories, what we would typically do is like to have a few samples uh, spaced out, not, you know, at least 10 days apart so that we know if, if we're on the downward trend of a bloom, we're not just seeing a weather induced effect, um, like a storm coming through and washing things out. Could, could it bounce back? maybe we should give it some time. Um, so in uh, early September, we, you know, we had those DEQ folks that were still going out weekly for those observations of the filamentous sites that they're, they're already doing on a weekly basis. And so after that storm event, they noticed most of the mats are gone. They don't appear to be coming back. Um, and so with VDH and DEQ put their heads together, okay, well, let's look at six or seven sites that are trying to encompass our advisory area that we have. We can't go back everywhere that we originally issue advisories, but let's, you know, have a wide swath. Um, and uh, where we also had very high levels of toxins, we definitely want to resample there, which was up in this area of Strasbourg. So these were the sites that we went back, resampled for water. Um, we had a few detects, but very, very low levels of toxins and uh, very low levels of PTOX cells. Um, nothing nearly as concerning as was before and repeated weekly uh, observations indicated we're not really seeing that growth. It doesn't seem to be coming back. And of course in September, um, we're getting out of the season. So that's ho hopefully we're, we're right on track and we decided to lift the advisory for the entire extent on uh, 916 based on the 914 samples. So about nine weeks under advisory in total from July 16th to September 16th. And being our first benthic advisory, a recreational advisory, we had some successes and definitely some challenges. Um, obviously that inability to 
get very far with mat analysis uh, was a little frustrating um, and not having funding to really send out mat samples to another lab was also frustrating. Uh, but we were able to get by with the water samples along with observations made by DEQ at weekly sites. That was a really helpful situation. Um, we also you know, struggled with staff shortages and um, we initially had some issues with sample collection, growing pains with a, a new methodology. And I'm also happy to say, you know, our friends of group that are, we're speaking for tonight, um, the algo map that where they have homeowners that sort of provide updates on conditions at various places along the river. We were looking at that map um, when we sort of lost the ability to get the samples we wanted. In addition to those DEQ observation sites, kind of fill in the gaps and, and see where we weren't able to go, what was going on there. So wanted to mention those health complaints again, just so you had a, an idea of what they were. Uh, the first one came, uh, I had mentioned at Seven Bend State Park, a uh, person that was teaching a fly fishing class was spent several days uh, back to back um, in the water, above the water, you know, roughly water is aerosolizing. So there were some respiratory complaints um, and it, in addition to uh, skin exposure. Um, the, the onset didn't occur until the, the day following the last exposure. So it was almost as though there were several days of the exposure, the respiratory symptoms seemed to be the most persistent for this person. Um, there was also a skin rash with water. You know, there's so many different pathogens in water that can uh, cause skin rashes. So those are really hard to correlate with HAB. Um, and also the, uh, the result of the samples uh, the samples that were collected on 712 by DEQ this is right after the last date of exposure, right in the vicinity um, where this person had been um, exposed. So we didn't see any PTOX cells. Um, and because we didn't see the cells, we didn't analyze toxins to be uh, to conserve our resources. So it's hard to say because you can be a little hit or miss if, if there's not a super prevalent bloom where you can see mats uh, forming to sample around them. We're not really sure whether that was a HAB related event or not, but it is certainly suspect since we ended up having a much larger bloom that did occur in the river there. Um, and then obviously at our ODU lab, our staff, there was three staff members who had um, reported effects. Two of them participated in the interview with our epidemiologist. Um, the exposure ranged from 30 minutes to seven hours, just depending on how long the person needed to do work in the lab and was working around that mat material. And the way that they process the mat material itself is they actually put it in a blender. And so you can imagine it's macerating all of those cells and trying to break the cell walls apart to release the toxins. So you're gonna get some activity in the air and then sort of being bent over a microscope, your face is very close to the sample that's um, under the light. So variety of neurological symptoms were, were reported in this case, in addition to the respiratory, um, numbness, um, muscle weakness, nausea, and a little skin irritation. But again, thankfully, these symptoms all dissipated um, as soon as that stimulus was, you know, they were removed from the area where the toxins were, all of those symptoms dissipated. So um, I had shown this kind of briefly, this OHABS icon on the bottom right, this is a system that CDC maintains where we can report health effects of people as well as pets or any kind of animal mor mortalities to provide tracking and data collection around illnesses associated with HAB events to increase our knowledge and understanding of those impacts um, as they occur. So we put that information into the system based on these health effects that were reported. Um, and because the, the ODU one was occupational in, in nature, it helps to inform other occupational people that might be exposed and to better inform those working in and around these materials of the precautions they should be taking to protect this, the health and safety of their workers. So some of the, the recreational water advisories lessons learned and ideas to kind of take with us into 2022 on a local basis, you know, where we have the local health department, um, trying to continue our improvement of working together, 
um, enhancing our stakeholders list so we can reach more people um, and try to continually get feedback on how we can more effectively communicate the risks um, associated with this kind of bloom event. And we wanna make sure we keep on utilizing and having dialogue with our, um, our water body folks um, and see how we might uh, continue using the ALGA watch map, uh, taking a look at that um, for those updates where we aren't able to have other information. Um, and then of course, as the staff are available, um, those DEQ sites for filamentous. Um, statewide, um, we obviously pretty quickly saw the need to identify a lab where if we had funding, we could send samples for MAT analysis. Um, we also wanted to see how we could better raise awareness about this kind of bloom and how it differs from other blooms because pets are more risk um, and how people can protect their, their furry partners when they're out and about, as well as livestock. Um, we have a, a decent social media presence for the waterborne program as well, but we don't really have any mat visuals to try to show people the difference between mat, mats versus planktonic blooms. Um, and we also have some signage that could be placed. Um, we're gonna talk with VCR to see if, um, since we have a bloom that may occur again to get some signage uh, uh, to raise awareness of park uh, patrons about the potential for blooms. Um, we want to push our virtual have toolkit and um, we're very interested in engaging emergency planners in the area. Um, sometimes emergency planners have access to funds that we don't, um, that might be applicable for use during benthic events where we have an advisory. Sorry for the dog barking dog. Somebody's banging on the ceiling above, so sorry about that. Now we're gonna flip over and talk a little bit about the drinking water have response. So we work in the rec water side. Our partners in the office of drinking water are working with uh, treatment plants. And so when we started to have the bloom, we were looking at Winchester, Strasburg and the Winchester, Winchester, Strasburg and Woodstock. So um, they began first at Strasburg because that's where we had some really high toxins in the mat material and we're also seeing it in the water column. Um, they began some twice weekly ELISA. ELISA is what the analysis we use at our ODU lab. Um, and they were also using some toxin test strips to kind of test the source water, the incoming water into the plant, as well as um, looking at the, the, the finished water. So they started with Strasburg, then they went to Winchester and we're looking at Woodstock as well. And the timeline, as you can see, it kind of follows through September until we were able to get to low enough levels where we felt we could discontinue the testing altogether. I wanted to show you some um, graphic representation of just how close we came to issuing pretty impactful, what would have been a very impactful advisory here. Um, so we had just updated our advisory guidance for recreation. So we had thresholds for all four toxins. Because we knew we were developing these new thresholds and we were gonna have the ability to analyze via ELISA for these four toxins. We wanted to work with our Office of Drinking Water partners to see if they would like to develop thresholds for drinking water for anatoxin A and uh, saxitoxin. EPA had issued drinking water thresholds for the other two, microcystin and cylindrous from back in 2019. So they had a threshold to use for those two, but they didn't have thresholds for issuing or lifting do not drink advisories for the other two, neurotoxins, anatoxin, and saxotoxin. So we had gotten on the ball with them and had been already looking at what other seats were doing and what seemed reasonable, what, what route um, or what options might be for them if they wanted to entertain adding some thresholds to their guidance. So they already had some, some background information, which came very useful in August when we had some, some tests that indicated we were very close to um, the threshold that would most likely be used. There was um, a threshold, oh, let me see, there's my sheet, so sorry, I off. So the, the threshold that they had selected was 0.4 parts per billion in the finished water. Um, we got as high as about 0.3 in the finished water that was detected. So that's pretty close. 
Um, and so they were able to utilize some funding um, that was um, delegated for an, another grant. They were able to repurpose that, got permission from EPA. So they had a, a funding source to continue weekly testing to support that uh, utility there at Strasburg. Um, these, this picture on the right, that is a um, sort of like a one hour test that you can do, uh, just a dipstick test. Uh, 7.30, um, when you're looking at that antitoxin A, you, if you don't see a result, you see a left control line. If you see white next to it, that's um, indicative of toxin being present. Um, it's more or less a present, presence absence test. You can't really use it quantitatively, um, but that was sort of the, the first result that sort of indicated, oh yeah, we've got to start doing some ELISA testing in both the raw water and, and the finished water. And so by the time we rolled into late August, um, they were no longer detecting um, very elevated levels in either the intake or the finished water, thankfully. The drinking water folks worked with the utility and the, the town folks to issue weekly press releases to keep the local folks updated about what was going on, what we were testing for. And that's very helpful if you are just very transparent and almost too much knowledge is better than you know, not enough. And then that way people are informed and they understand that the water is being protected and it is safe to drink. There were um, routine meetings as well with um, EPA um, to make sure that the, the needs were being met. Um, state and local government converse, conversations um, to prepare in case they needed to issue any advisories. Um, this was a situation where there were daily conversations with the lead operators as well. And for drinking water, what were their lessons learned? Well, because this was the first time they had to activate their um, have response plan, they were able to identify an opportunity to make some adaptations as they went along. And the test strips, um, as we had echoed you, they're, they're a little hard to interpret. Um, and so they ended up moving um, into you know, the gold standard for drinking water is actually mass spec, um, not Liza that we use for the, the rec water, but that testing method um, has a very long turnaround time and it's also prohibitively expensive. Um, so they decided that they expedited their processes using Eliza, even though the mass spec was required as part of their plan. It's just not something that they could rely on in order to get results fast enough. And so that they decided to make some adjustments in their plan. Um, they haven't made any decisions yet for ongoing or pre-detection going into 2022, but those conversations are ongoing. And we are also um, in the works with um, our rec water team and the office of drinking water team, we're going to do an after action exercise to talk about how we can work better together, communicate more effectively, more than likely we will have another bloom in the upcoming season. And so that, in a nutshell, is our presentation. Um, I am supposed to ask you to directly send your questions to the Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River in the chat. If we don't get any questions, um, I have some questions for you guys. Um, we also want you to know about the upcoming lecture on December 16th. Uh, water Supply Plan with Don Crockett. You can register at that web link below. And then um, we're very, very interested in getting some feedback from you all so that we can make sure we're tapping into all of our resources out there um, and getting, you know, can we communicate more effectively? Did the, the signs we use, were they easy to interpret? Do we need to change any of our methodology going into the next season? Um, we have some examples. There's a California sign that's a little bit different compared to the Virginia sign that we have. We're interested in knowing about whether our status reports, which is kind of a one pager with a map, we think that's a easier way to kind of interpret where the advisories are and it's really short, succinct versus our press releases. But we want to hear from you and just kind of know, you know, what, what other resources do we not know about that we might be able to tap into? So Questions for you, please. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if you have them for me as well. Thanks for uh, for joining us today.
Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, we have actually quite a few questions. Um, but I think it's important to save time for the questions you have up there. Do you mind while I start um, reviewing the questions to put links to the VA sign and the CA, the Virginia and California signs into the chat? Sure. Just as it's not a clickable link for us. And while you're working yeah. on that, let me know when you're ready to take a question. Oh, and that's also something I can do if you like retrospectively. Okay, yeah, that might be easier. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, and then we can, if you want to send me those questions, I can also distribute those if you want written responses. Great. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. So one of the first questions is, can you speak in more detail to the potential effects of harmful algae blooms on drinking water intakes? Like as specifically at what point does it become a problem for drinking water systems and infrastructure? So one of the things that we tried to do with the rec water advisory is when we were talking to USGS and EPA is they had said that if you issue a rec water advisory that sort of encompasses where your intakes are, you can prevent foot traffic, which could exacerbate um, release of toxins by uh, benthic mats that might be in the vicinity of intakes. And so if you, um, I guess if you, if you know you have a mat bloom around your intakes, just doing some surveys can be really useful, but in terms of the, the risk to drinking water, it depends on the drinking water plant and their pretreatment. A lot of times they can adjust the pretreatment processes to make sure they're not destroying cell walls and they can adjust some of their um, pretreatment chemicals to avoid that process. Um, and they can um, enhance some filtering processes sometimes as well, just depending on their treatment process. Um, but essentially if, if the treatment is resulting in um, an exceedance of that threshold, that draft threshold, which um, the ODW had folks had identified based on the toxicology support staff um, saying, you know, this, this is what we think is reasonable. Everyone sort of agreed this would be a, a good level 0.4 parts per billion is what they were looking at. Um, if it exceeds that level, they would then be pushed to issue um, a do not drink advisory. If the treatment plant does not have a backup water supply, to switch to, then you've got to truck watering. And that gets very expensive, <laughs> depending on your population as well. So it is inc incredibly inconvenient. Um, and whenever that has happened, um, you know, it's it's a, a big pain. And of course, you 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 have a lot of folks that start to wonder and doubt whether their water is safe. Um, and even if you say that it's safe and we're doing testing, um, and that could increase uh, restrictions on the availability of other water sources as well if people are feeling like what's coming out of the tap isn't safe. So those are some of the immediate impacts that we start to think about. Uh, I can, uh, I'll be happy to refer you to our ODW staff. We also have um, some links we can share for their, their response plan that they have in place currently. That sounds great, thank you. Um, another question was, is it the local VDH office that issues the harmful algae bloom advisory, not the Richmond headquarters? It can be either one. Um, all of our, we have 35 health districts with um, basically an autonomous health director who acts on the authority of the commissioner. And so in Richmond, we have the commissioner, that's where he's stationed, but any of our health directors can work on his authority to issue advisories. Um, they can do them preemptively without results, which that first advisory that went out on social media was preemptive without any, any information from our samples, which is fine. You, you can all, the, the health directors can certainly act within their authority to let the public know that there is an investigation and there could be a have present in that, in that water body. Thank you. 
Is there any responsibility to post public access areas of the river with BDH advisories? And if so, who does that posting? And then same for the removal when it ends. Okay. I'm gonna scoot back up here to where I have some signs. Our warning signs here on the far left are the signs that we have that we use for posting advisories. We would be inclined to post these at public access points such as uh, boat ramps, um, if we have marinas and we have staff that can go out and ask for permission to post at marinas, usually marinas will allow that as well. Um, any, any kind of public dock, you have a restaurant with a dock, same thing, we can ask permission. If people have a very prominent private area and they want to post signs, you can print these off and just go to our website, print it, get laminated, and you can post it yourself. If you want to, to let folks know that might be passing by in, in, a, in a kayak or what have you that, you know, that this is an area where you want to avoid exposure right now due to an ongoing bloom event. Um, so usually the, if we're posting at public sites, the local health department is going to work either exclusively to get them posted, or they're going to work with local parks and uh, staff, local government staff, um, to try to get them posted where it makes the most sense. Um, so that's usually what happens. And then of course they'll, they'll go out and they'll take them back down once the advisory is lifted. But again, these are available on our website. If you wanna print them off, laminate them and post them yourself, um, please post them in the advisory area only <laughs> and take them down of course, once the advisory has ended. Um, and all of our um, advisory information appears on our website. Again, that status report as well as press releases appear on our website. Um, and we have links that we can share. If you, you wanna take a look at the status report, the signs, if, if other signs there, because California has so many miles of blooms that they're issuing advisories for, they have very tailored messaging that they have tested uh, that works best for their communities there. Um, if, if our sort of the sign we developed for the more bowl-shaped water bodies, the, the planktonic blooms, if, if we think we need to maybe tailor that and create some that are more tailored to pet safety, that sort of thing, because that's who's most at risk with in relation or, or livestock. Um, but you know, people with their pets, they like to go boating with their pets and walking along pathway, pathways where, where pets may want to drink water if they get, get thirsty to try to encourage them not to do that. So if more tailored messaging would be better, let us know. Awesome, well, that leads right into the next question, which you've also asked of us to suggest, but um, how can we as citizens get involved in raising awareness of the algae blooms, I guess, beyond the posting of it? Uh, of yeah, beyond, if you have any, uh, so homeowners association groups where you have um, waterfront landowners uh, making sure that they're aware and that they, they if they have um, cattle with access, making sure that they're aware that they, they provide their livestock with an alternative watering source while the bloom's ongoing so that they're not suffering losses. Um, and then of course, you know, if, if you have um, an HOA or something like that where you do a newsletter or updated events using your pre-existing distribution lists to share information is a great way, probably easy way, just get the word out. Um, more than likely when this happens, it's kind of a big thing and a lot of people know about it, but if you have kind of transient folks that are only coming in on the weekends, they can miss those messages. So um, that can be helpful. Awesome, thanks. Uh, is there money in the budget for HAB testing of the North Fork in 2022? We have very limited amount of money in general for freshwater testing. So just our planktonic blooms that we tend to get a lot of reports for. Um, for example, Lake Anna, um, we have many sites that we tend to do and analyze there. Essentially, there is no set aside budget period for freshwater testing. We have what was, you know, set aside by the General Assembly years ago, a budget that was aimed for marine support and testing for seafood. So what we've essentially had to do is sort of borrow from that budget in order to support these 
ever escalating needs in, in freshwater and now, you know, in, in these free flowing systems, as opposed to lakes and reservoirs that we already knew we had problems. So we just keep getting more and more problems, but um, no increase in the budget. And we've made a few attempts for sure to request additional funds. Um, just hasn't happened yet. And um, we have a, a proposal. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, and those of you that are involved and participate at all in the General Assembly, um, feel free to kind of um, look around and see what bills are coming up. Budget amendment bills. Thanks. And we have a final comment or suggestion, suggestion, right. suggestion, excuse me. And that is that DEQ and VDH routinely contact local veterinarian services to solicit any, so to solicit for any complaints of have exposure for dogs and other pets. Um, and beyond that, I would love to distribute the questions you've shared here. And thank you so much for your time. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to email them to friends at fnfsr.org and we can send them on to Margaret. Um, or I'm sure you've also opened yourself up to getting feedback directly. So that seems like a good avenue as well. Um, don't forget to attend that upcoming lecture on the calendar um, with John Crockett and um, if you have any thing else that you're interested in getting involved with at Friends of the North Fork um, in terms of your interests related to the river or other events we have on the calendar, definitely, uh, again, send us an email at friends at fnfsr.org. We're always looking uh, to hear from people directly about what sort of programming you want put on the calendar. And this series actually was born out of one such request, just about information related to the harmful algae blooms and river health in general. So thank you so much for your time, Margaret. And I hope everyone- Thank you. Thanks folks.